This is Hagerstown, Maryland, Monday, July 27th, 2020. Kevin Wells is our speaker, Jack Ames with the DefendLife.org uh, Face the Truth Tour. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, especially those who are watching on Facebook Live. We're here in beautiful Hagerstown City Park. There's no city park in America quite as beautiful as this. So if you ever get to Hagerstown, come to see this city park. There's lakes, there's an art museum, there's ducks, there's beautiful picnic pavilions, there's wonderful places for children to play. Hagerstown City Park. You also get to see the, the home of Jonathan Hager, who founded all this. Our speaker today will be Kevin Wells. Kevin Wells just recently wrote a wonderful book. The name of the book is The Priest the Church Needs, or The Priest We Need to Save the Church. Anyway, a little background on Kevin and his book. Kevin grew up in Maryland. He went to a, a local Catholic high school. What's the name of it? DeMatha. Wonderful Catholic high school, especially known for its uh, athletic teams. Had this great legendary basketball coach, Morgan Wooten, who died recently. But he was first of all Catholic, and then he was a wonderful coach in addition to that. Well, that's where this our wonderful speaker, Kevin Wells, went to high school. And then he always wanted to be a sports announcer, a sports, actually a sports writer. And he wound up covering the Tampa Bay, what's the name of the Tampa Bay team? Rays. The Tampa Bay Rays, the Tampa Rays, down in Tampa. And he did that for a number of years. And that's where he ultimately met his wife there in Florida. But he ultimately came back to Maryland and worked for the family business they're masonry contractors, they do great work. Ten, actually 20 years ago, his wonderful uncle, Monsignor Thomas Wells, was viciously murdered. Is any murder not vicious? Viciously murdered in his rectory at Mother Seton Church in Germantown, Maryland. We've been there many times for our basic tour. Well, anyway, he was prompted to write this book uh, about the priest that the church needs to survive. And you'll also be writing a book that he's working on about the venerable Aloysius Schwartz, a great missionary who did great things, but very few people remember who Aloysius Schwartz was. Ladies and gentlemen, especially those of you out in Facebook land, please welcome Kevin Wells. Jack Ames, thank you very much. Can everyone hear? Yeah. Yes. 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 Okay. <laughs> Just gonna lay a land here. Okay, very good. So, Jack, thank you. It's um, you know, it's always very cliche and typical to say it's an honor to be here, but here's here's what I really feel. Here's what my gut says that I'm with the best of the best, and I feel like I'm in the upper room underneath this gazebo. <laughs> I, I do. <laughs> this is this is the elite. This is God's elite. This is sort of the. Uh, I think what this is, is you guys are the ones, you are the baton who is being passed to this church that we know is being torn asunder before our very eyes because of ideological unsound bishops and priests, etc., etc. This is you, pro-life the Fen Life tour folks, you are the baton that's going to pass off to the church that Pope Benedict foretold 10 years ago, the smaller, holier church. But without you guys doing it, I don't know if it would have been done the way it should have been done because you're leading with life. You're leading with saving babies from murder. Um, I can't tell you how many times, yeah, I can. Five or six times as a masonry contractor traveling all around the Beltway, Connecticut Avenue, Route 3, where I've stopped my car, gotten out in the middle of a busy day, where I had to go to a job site, when I saw you guys with the signs, and I stood with you guys, and I kept saying, man, why aren't I out here with a stinking sign? These guys get it. These guys are God's martyrs. 
So I'd stay there for 15 minutes, half an hour, and I'd hold signs, and nobody knew me, and I'd be honest, I felt a little bit ashamed. Right? That the next time I'd see a year later, I'd do the same thing again. So for me to be here right now, I'd be honest, I'm a little bit humble, because I'm with guys, I'm with individuals who are true heroes, not silly ones who don't put in the sweat equity. You guys are sweat equity Catholics, Protestants, Christians, whoever's here, you are put in the sweat equity. Now, I want to turn my attention before I get into my story. And, and by the way, Jack, how, how much time? It's, uh, I don't know what time it is. How much time are we going to give you here? It is, Jack, it's uh, 2.37. 37. 2.37. We, we need to wrap up uh, completely by 3.25. 3.25? Let me get moving. And that includes Christ and Bring <coughs> Let's get moving. Uh, <laughs> boys, right here. You, 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 you. I want to center the start of this talk on that table. We are sorely lacking heroes today in the Catholic Church. That's right. Sorely lacking heroes. Amen. What I beg of you four young men, what I beg of you guys, and I beg you, and I beg you, and I beg you, please consider no force feeding here. Just consider spending a little time each day presenting to God. God, I think I might have what it takes to become a Catholic priest, but I don't know. I don't know. You lead me, whether it's a yes or whether it's a no. I'm at least going to open myself up to it. The fact, and the reason I say this, and I've done retreats at Damatha High School and all sorts of groups. But the reason I say it to you for is because of where you're sitting right now. You're sitting with the martyrs. And you've made a choice to do so. So you guys already have it in you. It's built into your DNA. It's built into your nature. Virtue is built into your nature. So you already got what it takes. That's why I address you right now. Last thing I'll say on that is too many priests have gone in without having what you have built into the nation. They thought maybe by piecemeal work or God would just kind of provide it. No. You guys have it. So that's it. Just do me a favor and do it. And I'll pray for you guys too. Um, all right, off to the races. So, so, uh, now During this time, we need these pinholes of light during this time. We know that there seems to be this invisible poisonous World War II gas that floats above the world right now. We all know it and feel it. It's almost like a, um, almost like this, um, this disturbance. There's a disturbance, a demonic fog. And, it, and in certain ways, it kind of disturbs us, paralyzes us. It gives us a little bit of anxiety and anguish. You guys are all filled with Jesus Christ. You're fine. But it's there. And it hovers. And it doesn't go anywhere. It just sticks. With that in mind, I want to try and part this now. Because God does not change. Our church has changed, and our world's changed, and America's changed, but God does not change. So we can always go to Him when we're suffering and when we're fearful. I think we all know that. But I want to tell a story right now of how God responds in remarkable ways. My wife and I got married in Florida in 1998. We wanted to have 10 kids. We both agreed we want to have a large family. We found out we clinked classes in Chianti, of Chianti in Tuscany, to toast our first child. And we found out about six months later that we could have no children, zero children. God would not bless us that way. God did not bless us that way. My wife at the time was working for a Catholic church in St. Pete Beach, Florida. Her pastor, her boss, told her that it was permissible to pursue in vitro fertilization if her conscience was clear. I, on the other hand, was raised in a family of ten that, you know, thank God, I had nothing to do with it, but I was catechized and brought up in the Catholic faith, and I was taught 
that in vitro fertilization was not permissible. So the very thing the priest is ordained to do is to teach people, teach couples, how to carry the cross, the blue whale-sized crosses, together. The very thing he was ordained to do, he rejected and set a lie into our marriage. And he divided us, watered in the Grand Canyon. So what a way to start a marriage. What a honeymoon. She was only happy at this point when I walked into another room. And I was only happy when she did. Welcome to marriage. She was hell-bent for the child that she knew could grow within her womb. And I said, sweetie, we can't. And she was Hatfield, and I was McCoy. And we just loaded up on shotguns. And it got worse and worse and worse. So I quit my job as a Major League Baseball writer when I spent 10 years working for it. Krista, Krista quit. Krista quit her, she rode horses. She used to ride horses all over Florida. She was a hunter jumper. She quit horses, she quit her job. She was good enough and loving enough to say, you know what, we gotta go, we gotta get out of here. We lived in Florida, Florida, beautiful place, but the sunshine just felt like sweat. So we took the loneliest northbound I-95 trip ever taken so I could return back home. We packed up the U-Haul truck, we unloaded in Bowie, Maryland, and we unpacked the infertility with that, and it just got worse. It was in June of 2000 when I called my uncle up, Monsignor Tom Wells, who was <clears throat> generally regarded to be one of the strongest priests in the history of the Archdiocese of Washington. He shipped men in the priesthood, shipped men in the seminary. And I kept Krista away from him because I knew what would happen. But one day I called up, I said, Tommy, she cries herself to sleep at night, and I can't comfort her. She doesn't want me to touch her. Newly married couple. Buddy, come over. Buddy, come on over. Come over tonight. Bring Krista. And I didn't know if Krista would go. So you open up the passenger side door. <clears throat> she actually got in. We took a silent, tense-filled ride over the Germantown, Maryland. Went up to the deck of his back. The deck of back of his rectory. It was June 6, 2000. And he broke open what felt like an omnibus on redemptive suffering. He said that saints only became saints by working in total darkness. Saints only became saints in caves when they had no consolations, when they suffered, when they didn't have answers. And he said, Krista, I promise you, Kevin, I promise you, that this thing that happened to you, this infertility, in the face of wanting, desiring this big, large family, I promise you, this is the greatest gift you've ever been given. And I wanted to punch him in the face. <laughs> How dare you tell me that this horror that we have embraced is a gift. He said, you don't get it. God has just asked you to carry his cross up Golgotha. He wants you to carry the same pain that he is. He wants you to dip your fingers, dip your mind, dip your soul into his blood so you can be, form the most intimate relationship of your love life by doing one thing. Completely trust him. You've got nothing right now. You're in a cave. All your sisters, your in-laws, everyone's pregnant and having babies. It brings you great sorrow. It brings you envy. It brings you all this chocolate mess of agony. Trust God right now. It is a gift that he has given you. Your hell is the greatest gift because he wants you to walk right beside him. Because he's going to walk beside you. And in that cave, when you see the pinhole of light, walk towards it because that is him.
Two days later in that rectory, he was stabbed to death. So my wife, we don't have the time, but I'd like to share the background behind why he was stabbed to death, but you can research that yourself. It deals with priestly evil. So my wife had her entire life changed that night, and she understood the mystery of the cross. And she said, Kevin, I think we can do this. She had just lost her newfound shepherd. 3,000 people attended his funeral. It was like a chrism mass for three dioceses. 250 priests and deacons were there because they wanted to celebrate a holy priest. So life moves on, right? We adopted three children. Life is good. Business was rolling. I kind of like this masonry contracting gig. I missed writing, but, you know, oh well. So it's 2009, and I was at Loyal or Treehouse in Southern Maryland, and I've been going there for many, many, many years with my family. It's a silent retreat. Beautiful place. You're hard pressed to find a prettier place in the eastern seaboard of America. It sits way up on a cliffside that overlooks the Potomac River. It's a glorious place. And this particular weekend, which I went to back, back to every year, the first weekend of December, sits on 250 acres and I walked around, dropped my bag off in the room, I started to walk around, and I had this pricking awareness, this pricking understanding that I was not becoming the man that God wanted me to become. These little pinpricks would bother me. Tommy, my uncle just sent, showed me an omnibus on redemptive suffering. And when something would bother me, I'd start to complain or whatever. I, you know, my kids wanted to play Monopoly. I'd find a reason not to. My wife, you know, I just, I, I love my wife. And I was a pretty good dad. I did a good job. But I was slothful. And I found where pride had started to slide. And I just wasn't satisfied. And no matter where I went, confession, I heard another talk by a priest. I went to holy hour, whatever. I couldn't escape this awareness that I wasn't obliging God's will in my life. So, what I did was, what I always do, around midnight, the night before I left, I went down to this dock, way down this hill, on the water. And this particular night, there was a full moon, a very bright moon, the whole sky was lit up with stars because there's no lights down there, so you can see the Milky Way, and, and I'm on this dock. And I started in again, like I always do, I said, God, help me to go back, taking all this these wise talks by these priests, and I'm free of my sin for confession, and boy, last night's holy hour, three in the morning, I felt really good and all that, and, and, I, and, and, and it just came to me, it was like God was sitting on a stool, almost like the full moon was like, a, he was a watchman, he was just swinging the lantern, and it's like, oh, here he comes again, here he comes again. Something came to me and never came in my life, I've never sniffed at it in my life. And it was, God, you sent your son down to redeem all of humanity by asking him to endure violence. And he saved everything. God, maybe what it's going to finally take to click in, maybe I need violence. God, i got to get this thing right, so make it violent. And I asked for a spiritual lightning bolt that night, and I started to cry because I knew I had walked into a wilderness that was untamed that he would answer. I knew it. There wasn't a doubt about it. And I fell to the dock, and I just wept, and it was beautiful tears. I went home, and for a month, that feeling didn't leave me. And I knew the other shoe was going to drop. And exactly one month later, almost to the exact taking second, I had a brain hemorrhage and I should have died. It's called an arterial venous malformation. It's like somebody took a tomahawk and threw it in the back of my head. They rushed me to a hospital, but nothing worked. The angiograms couldn't control the flow of blood. Nothing worked. The shunts kept clogging. So finally, I was in an MRI tube for like the second or third time in a week. My, my brain was drowning. 
I didn't have a whole lot of time left. They stuck me in there to see if the shunts or this angiogram they were threading up into my brain was doing the trick. And they had put this dye into my head, the contrast, and the contrast made me nauseous. So I started to vomit inside the MRI tube. And I thought at that moment to cry out, but I couldn't talk because the brain surgery, or the brain injury had rendered my speech obsolete. I couldn't talk. So I thought, you know what, this is how I'm gonna die. So God, this is your plan for my end. <laughs> things that I done wrong. I was thinking about not loving well enough, not being the man that God wanted me to do as far as my omissions rather than commissions. And I thought, man, I'm going to be sitting across from him in the next five minutes. Maybe I'll make it a good team. Maybe I'll actually make it through the night, but I'm going to be sitting across from him very soon, and I'm not going to be doing, or he's not going to be doing much talking. I, I got an idea he's going to ask me why did you not love well? And the slideshow begins. And that's a horrifying thought. I made it through the night. My wife called up. My uncle Monsignor Tom Wells, the dead priest, called up his best friend, Father Jim Stack, who had just, through a supernatural experience in Guadalupe, had come by a healing ministry. Krista called him up and said, Father Stack, Kevin needs you. They just gave him invasive brain surgery. The next day after the MRI was bad, it went to the back of my head. You know, an all day long surgery and they couldn't get to the malformation. And they closed me back up and this was the day to die. And that's when Krista called Father Stack and said, get up here. So he drove up from Hyattsville, St. Jerome's in Hyattsville, and he took his healing minister associate with him, Mary Pat Donahoe. He prayed the Divine Mercy Chaplain and started calling on the Maryland Saints, Mother Mary Lang, Elizabeth Van Seaton, John Newman, begging for intercession. And if he was here right now, if Father Stack was here right now, here's what he would tell you pro-lifers. He said he came into my dark ICU room, and I had been incapacitated since the surgery. And he said he knelt down by my bedside. And he said, Kevin, we've been calling on the saints. We need a saint now. Is there any that you want us to call on for you? And if Father Stack was here, he'd say that I opened my eyes and I said, bring Tommy down. And he stood up like the eighth moment and said, Course. So he went to the foot of my bed and started calling his best friend. He said, Tommy, bud, your nephew Keg, he's dying. If you don't save him, he's going to die. You need to save him right now. That's what he would tell you if he was standing here right now. Immediately thereafter, lights started to pop all around the ICU room. The temperature of the room went from a cold, sort of an antiseptic cold room, hospital room, to like a coaxing warmth, like when you come out of a winter storm and sit by the fireplace, it was very warm and welcoming. Mary Pat almost fainted. She had to grab onto the bed. And Father Stack said, ah, I knew I was standing in front in the middle of the supernatural, but I knew it was a miracle. I knew I was standing in the middle of a miracle when I saw the heavenly court surrounding your bed and your uncle was standing next to me. That's when I knew you were saved. <clears throat> the next day they stuffed me back in the MRI tube and everything was gone. The blood, the fluids, the arterial venous malformation. Wow. I was saved. So, life takes off, right? And when I came back I stopped seeing people. I stopped seeing people. I started to see souls. So in the boredom of my recovery, I couldn't get out of bed. 
Um, when you get brain surgery, you're messed up. So for six months, I couldn't do much of anything. I wrote a book. I wrote this book. In the aftermath of writing the book, the way it works is you give talks. And at the talks, what I started to see was this. And this is the crux of today's talk. What I started to see was, in this room, in this line, it was, hey, Kevin, I want to tell you about your Uncle Tom Wells. My husband was cheating on me. I knew it. He knew it. He didn't care. Your uncle went to him and said, you know what? You're probably going to go to hell. If you want to know how to not go to hell for the horror that you're doing to your family and wife, come see me. But until then, good luck down there. He saved my marriage. Now my husband's a daily communicant. My line over here, my line, oh, Kevin, your book was inspirational. It was really great. It was great. This line over here, hey, Kevin, um, my son, my son, when he was 18, was being bullied, hated his life, tried to kill himself. Your uncle came in, my, your uncle came in the room one night, 10 o'clock, knocked on the door with his clerics, unasked, went to his room, changed everything. My son now is married with two kids, happiest man in the world. My line, oh, Kevin, man, that was a funny thing you wrote on page 34. That was really good. I kept hearing this wherever I went, and I finally put it together. Inspiration, if it's not attached to transformation or conversion, is worthless. Over here was a man who dove into souls. So time went on, right? And in my parish in Baltimore Archdiocese, I kept seeing over and over and over, week after week after week, a contraception of the Catholic faith, a contraception of the sacraments, a contraception of anything that can set us right for heaven. So what I thought, big dummy that I am, big athlete from the math of, well, I'll start a men's group. Uh, you know, I'll bring in that man as you program. Oh, how about First Friday Holy Hours? Maybe I can do that. And what I started to realize was that if the pastor and the associate didn't back, didn't support this call to holiness, then it was going to wither on the vine, and every stinking time it withered on the vine. And when I would approach Father, and charitably, I think, but candidly, charitably say, Father, why do you never encourage me to lead a family rosary? Father, I... I've never heard you mention the need for me to go to confession. And you're only open 45 minutes a week. No, Father, why not encourage just a monthly holy hour for the family? We got, a, we got an adoration chapel right here. It's like it's a closet. Well, Kevin, you got to understand, we got to meet people where they're at. So again, I'm from a family of priests. My brother's a priest. And I kept thinking, man, you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to, I'd like to tell priests for what I thirst for. And every time I thought that, work is busy, we're building buildings, we're building, doing houses all over the D.C. area, I shot it back down because what an arrogant thing for a member of the lady to say, tell a priest how to be a priest. But it kept rising up. Shot it down, a year later it would rise up. It rose up because of what I saw from behind Ambos, what I saw in altars. Finally, one day, I was at the office. I, got, I work with three brothers. My father still works with us. We've been around since the 1950s. Finally, one day, I said, you know what? It's not telling a priest your opinions arrogantly. It's just telling a priest that you desire holiness. And in a certain sense, you can't be holy until they demonstrate holiness. So when I decided that was the case, I looked my brother Danny in the eye and said, hey, man, I need eight months. I'm going to give you eight month notice. I'm taking a sabbatical. I got a book to write. He said, Are you nuts? I said, Yeah. Yeah, I am nuts, but I got to write this book. So I gave him eight months and I cut the cord and I started to write the book last two years ago. So the way it works in publishing is you write about four or five chapters and you send it off to Catholic publishers. I sent it off to nine Catholic publishers. Within a month, all nine Catholic publishers got back to me and said, we do not want your book. Why? You can't tell a priest how to be a priest. That's it's not the aim of the book. It's to tell a priest what I thirst for. I, I read about Vianney. I read about Bosco. I read about Neri. I read about Pio. 
I read about David and Malachi. And I read about John Vianney. I researched the paragons. I'm just presenting the paragons. Yeah, we kind of get it, but you can't tell a priest how to be a priest. So what happens? What happens when you take unpaid sabbatical and you're a family and you're a father with a family of five and you had a support? And you thought and you thought you discerned the Holy Spirit. Because you waited three, four, five, six, seven years. You waited to write this book. Well, it gets real dry. So they put this bike path in front of my house and I used to walk it every day. It was, it was the middle of summertime. No, it was actually early summertime. Spring, but I just remember being hot and dry. And I was so disorganized, so messed up. This fog was so strong that I couldn't even pray the rosary. I would just thumb the rosary and say, Mary, mother me now. Mary, mother me now. Mary, mother me now. And I didn't want to go back to the house. Because I couldn't write. I would sit down to write. My time to write was 5 in the morning until 12 noon, and I wouldn't get my butt out of the chair until I wrote. So sometimes I'd write two sentences. I couldn't write. Because once you're told by nine Catholic publishers you can't do this, and your zeal's over here, you're like a helicopter in the middle. You're like, I don't know how to write this stinking thing. I want to oblige my heart, but i got to make some money and sell a book. So I'd go to the Adoration Chapel, I'd walk across the street to the Adoration Chapel of my former parish, and I had nothing, I had no prayer, I couldn't pray. And I used to kneel down in front of the monstrance, and I used to rest my hands on the base of the monstrance, you know, like the hemorrhaging woman. And I said, man, I got nothing, God, I got nothing, Jesus, but I know I got your ear. And I know you hear what's inside, even though up here it's a big fat blank. You know what's in here, so I'm just going to rest my hand and do nothing. That was my custom. Two things happened. Time check. How much time I got? Uh, Two things happened during this time. Very, 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 very important things happened. So things are bad, things are dry, I can't write. Somebody has suggested, two people have suggested in the span of a week for me to visit a man named Monsignor John Essen. John Essen. John Essen, in 1959, received a bilocation from Padre Pio. He was Mother Teresa's confessor and spiritual director, director in the 1970s. One of the holiest men, he's 92 years old, one of the holiest men in America, in the world. Many, many, many people think that he will be a canonized saint in the Catholic Church. In 19, early 1980s, Mother Teresa said, John, I know you think it's your charism to serve the poor with me. It's not. It is your job to form priests. Teach priests how to become priests. Go back to America. So, what do you do when Mother Teresa tells you that? You go back to America. So, Monsignor Essa obliged the saint. And what he did was he started to visit seminaries throughout America. And what he saw horrified him. He saw seminarians that weren't praying. He saw seminarians that had no devotion to Mary. And he saw seminarians that did not love the Eucharist. And he saw seminarians that were homosexually active. And he said, if you're anti-Mary, if you're anti-Eucharist, if you're anti-prayer, and you're involved in that, you are of the demonic. And I began to see that seminaries, not all of them, Many seminaries were the sick womb, for lifers, the sick womb of Holy Mother Church. If you were intentional and strong and you wanted to be a John Vianney, you were going to be aborted in the womb. But if you were malformed and you weren't Eucharistic, eh, rosary, you know what, that's old hocus pocus stuff. Confession, eh, just get on your knees and ask God's forgiveness. 
you're going to be shot forward. He said, Monsignor Etza said, Kevin, I get it. I get that this book's going nowhere. Write this book. Monsignor, what do I write? Just write this book. Yeah, but I don't let, write what your heart tells you to write. Because the seminarians that I saw in the 80s and 90s and 2000s, they are today's priests. I'll add, Monsignor S. became an exorcist and teaches exorcists all over the world how to become them because of what he saw in those seminaries. Remember, he saw it as diabolical. He spent the last 25 years of life being an exorcist. And priests from all over the country see him every day in spiritual direction. A woman said one day, that same week, one of my wife's good friends, Teresa Fritz, a daily communicant, said, Kevin, I the weirdest thing happened. It was in holy hour last night, and I saw Mary, a vision of Mary, and she had she had your book in her lap. And I'm like, my book, my book stinks. No one wants it. I can't even write it. No, no, no. Kevin, she had your book in her lap, and she said to me, "Tell Kevin, my son will release it when he wants to." And I thought, well, that's stupid, but I'll take it. Things are dry. I'll take it. I normally blow those things off, but I took it. June 21st, 2018, something finally broke. Something providential happened. The Washington Post ran a across-the-page banner headline, Cardinal McCarrick has been abusing boys. Then the deluge came. The Vatican bank scandals, the Pennsylvania grand jury report, Vatican orgy, problems in Honduras, Central America, Bransfield. The publisher started to call back. You're still working on that book. Yeah, I guess I guess you could say I'm working on the book. Oh great. Can we see it when you're yeah? see it. The president of EWTN called and he said, Dan Burke, and he said, Kevin, I heard what you're doing. Would you mind if you give me what you got? And I sent it to him, and the next day, Sophia Institute Press, who works under the umbrella of EWTN, said, we want, to, we want your book. What the book does, gentlemen, what the book does is propose one thing. Unless you're willing to die as a priest, as all the great priest saints did, you're not doing much. You've got to want to be a martyr in today's suffering Catholic Church. Since the book came out, um, it's been one of the top, sell top Catholic booksellers in the country. It still is. And bishops and priests from all over the world. Seminaries have said something very cool. A priest from England called the other day. An Anglican. And he said, hey, Kevin, I don't know how, but your book ended up in my seminary. When I became ordained 20 years ago, I wanted to be like this John Vianney you write about. And I came out of the shoot hard. I was praying hard. I wanted to be holy. And then my brethren started to poke fun at me. They said I smelled like incense. They said I lived in the chapel. And I bought in and I took my foot off the accelerator. And I became comfortable. I don't know how your book ended up in my rectory. But I read it, and you've re-engineered everything. I want to be a saint. Gentlemen, I am with you guys right now. Whatever God brings you is whatever God brings you, right? But just cooperate with him, whatever he brings you. But if you're not going to say, God, do you want me to be a martyr? 
that you're only halfway in the game. Because the church needs pro-life youngsters unafraid about holding signs up on a highway of what abortion actually is that will not back down, that will not look at the ground, that will square their shoulders and look the world in the eye and say, this is what you're doing. We need you for, if it's the priesthood, great. If it's not the priesthood, better. We need good husbands out there with big, fat families. But at least do me a favor, and I beg you guys, ask God, God, maybe you want me. Maybe you want me. Maybe I got the stuff. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you very much. With that said, we'll open up the question. Do we have a few quick questions? There's one right here. Okay. Yes, I have a question. Okay, so you said that you um, wrote your book, uh, you, that you had the opportunity to write your book from the heart. I'm just curious to know if, in the process of publishing it, if your publishers asked you to make any like changes or anything that you weren't really comfortable with. Woo. No, this the book's unbridled. Okay. And that's why I purchased it. Yeah, uh, I had the privilege of hearing Kevin because his brother was a priest at St. John Norman where I attended. I heard him last fall, bought his book, and I actually read the whole thing in a four hour plane trip. <laughs> Couldn't wait to give it to other people, and my wife and I have bought numerous copies, given it to family, and they are now buying copies of it. One of the best, most inspirational, sees the problems and the solutions that many of us have seen going on for years. So we've gotten it for all. We had uh, four homeschoolers who have become priests, and we bought copies for each of them. Wow. So I guarantee you will not be sorry you bought this <laughs> Thank you very much. What's, what's your name again? I'm sorry. Barry Sullivan. I'm at your. Oh, you're Barry. Yeah. Oh, you're Barry. Oh my. God. So yeah, well, Barry, give me a break. Barry, Barry's one of the best right books, there. and I've read many, many of the great books. But as far as compactness, easy reads, and Barry, I didn't know. I didn't know you were this handsome. Not now. I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> My, my question um, is like, um, how much of the book just flowed through? How like when you were saying about how like you uh, just got when you were saying ah, how much of the just came out into the paper? I great question. Going. So listen, remember when I said my hand was on the monstrance? Yeah. Well, when I had nothing, he was pouring the book into my heart, mm -hmm. into my head. So when when EWTN accepted it, I sat down. 800 words on a Monday, 1,200 words on a Tuesday, 1,300 words on a Wednesday, wow. and the book just poured out because he put it in me. Yes, this book is. isn't mine. And I don't say that in sort of a silly way, like, oh, he's so humble. This book is not mine. This book is about Tom Wells. It's about heroes who are, who can't write about a hero? This book is from Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Any more questions? Yes. yes. So the question was, have I read Infiltration? That's my opinion on Taylor Marshall. And Oh, yeah. Yeah. So so yeah, I, I, I didn't read all of Infiltration. I read about half of it. And you know why I stopped reading it? Because I'm kind of sensible not true. Yeah. So, 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 yeah. I, I believe, I, I believe strongly in what Taylor Marshall had to say. I think Taylor Marshall said, "I got to be candid." I didn't like what he said a while ago, where he said that if you go to a Novus Ordo Mass, it's, it's, it will never be reverently, um, will never be a, a reverent representation of the sacrifice of the Mass. Um, I think that's a dangerous thing to say. Uh, I, think, I think Taylor Marshall is very strong, very wise, very smart. He makes some incredible points. He's a leader, but he's got to watch himself sometimes because he has a lot of friends, a lot of friends, a lot of followers who are Novus Ordo Catholics, and and that, 
that was pretty damaging. Um, but anyway, the book the book was a, a fine book in, the, in, our, in our area. One last question. This uh, area, uh, yeah, was it you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I do want to ask a question. But first, I'd like to ask, what do you mean by Novus Ordo? Novus Ordo, that's, that is uh, after Vatican II. But see, there was some misreadings of Vatican II. Yeah. And, and um, Vatican II is when the, the priest flipped around and started facing the people. That's the new mass. Novus Ordo means new mass. So, so the majority of Catholics, most, most people here, I imagine, are Novus Ordo Catholics. I, I've been to traditional mass. I've been to you know Novus Ordo. I've been to I faced. I, 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 as a matter of fact, the, the church I go to now, the priest faces the east. He faces the tabernacle. Um, but Novus Ordo is the mass as it is today. It, it's, it's the post-Vatican II mass. Well, that's right. right. the one we've been doing for years. Yeah. Yes. I was wondering when that happened. June 8th, 2000. June 8th, 2000. Yeah. Tommy's working for you. Yeah. I'd like to think so. Well, you could have turned that into an angry person that was just gone into fetal, fetal position. Let's look what's happened with the grace of God. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think of that all the time. You are the one that could turn into a test. We were after that. What are the issues? Yeah, there's, there's, there's two ways of going, right? You, you right. get angry and bitter. Or you, right, you know, right. So. Little did we ever have. He was set to leave. He was so tall, and his face was so beautiful. And he let us. You're the only woman who's ever said Tom Wells was face was beautiful. <laughs> he had a big nose, he had a receding hairline. He had a beautiful look on his face. He did. No, no, no. Tom Wells, Tom Wells had those cerulean blue eyes, and when he held up the hose, right. he was beautiful. Yeah. He became Jesus at the Last Supper. He, he was behind us. Yes. Just by his presence. Are you Thank selling you. your book? Thank you. Yes, yes, I'm selling the book if anyone's interested.